22nd and 23rd of June, 2021 at IPDJ, Lisbon News Center, Portugal. The peer learning activity aims to bring together member states, young people, researchers and key players in the field of youth for an exchange of views on rethinking youth and youth policies aligned with the rights-based approach. A rights-based approach to youth policies is one of the main priorities of the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the European Union in okay, the field test. of youth, in line with the EU. All works. Hello, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, peer running activity on rights-based approach to youth policies. I'm Manuel, I'll be your moderator for this session together with my colleague uh, Sojana Petov Petkovic. Um, the event will be, in, uh, we have some few, we're going to start in a few minutes. We have a, the event will be in English and Portuguese. So in case we need translation, there's an option in your Zoom uh, session. Uh, please go to your bottom of your Zoom window and select the language of your preference. Uh, if you're using a cell phone or a tablet, please you click on the three dots on the, in the bottom left corner and uh, click on interpretation and then choose the language in which you want to listen to this conference. You also can use the chat to call for technical assistance in case you need it. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, as you know, on day one, but also on day two, we have some breakout sessions. For the breakout sessions on day one, please go to the website, uh, log in to your account. The, the login uh, uh, password and username were sent to your email. Use these and click on working sessions and uh, select the session in which you want to participate in. Uh, the sessions will start around 11.30, so please do so uh, beforehand so we can join you. Uh, we can put you in the right room. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll come back when the session will start. Who organized the peer learning activity, PLA, a rights-based approach to youth policies in a hybrid format on the 22nd and 23rd of June, 2021 at IPDJ, Lisbon News Center, Portugal. The peer learning activity aims to bring together member states, young people, researchers, and key players in the field of youth for an exchange of views on rethinking youth and youth policies aligned with the rights-based approach. A rights-based approach to youth policies is one of the main priorities of the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the European Union in the field of youth, in line with the EU Youth Strategy 2019-2027. In this framework, the Portuguese Institute of Sport and Youth and the European Commission, in cooperation with the European Youth Forum and the Portuguese National Youth Council, co-organized the Peer Learning Activity, PLA, a rights-based approach to youth policies in a hybrid format on the 22nd and 23rd of June, 2021 at IPDJ, Lisbon News Center, Portugal. The peer learning activity aims to bring together member states, young people, researchers, and key players in the field of youth for an exchange of views on rethinking youth and youth policies aligned with the rights-based approach.
a rights-based approach to youth policies is one of the main priorities of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union in the field of youth, in line with the EU Youth Strategy 2019-2027. In this framework, the Portuguese Institute of Sport and Youth and the European Commission, in cooperation with the European Youth Forum and the Portuguese National Youth Council, co-organized the Peer Learning Activity, PLA, a rights-based approach to youth policies in a hybrid format on the 22nd and 23rd of June 2021 at IPDJ, Lisbon Youth Centre, Portugal. The peer learning activity aims to bring together member states, young people, researchers and key players in the field of youth for an exchange of views on rethinking youth and youth policies aligned with a rights-based approach. A rights-based approach to youth policies is one of the main priorities of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union in the field of youth, in line with the EU Youth Strategy 2019-2027. In this framework, the Portuguese Institute of Sport and Youth and the European Commission, in cooperation with the European Youth Forum and the Portuguese National Youth Council, co-organized the Peer Learning Activity, PLA, a rights-based approach to youth policies know, so in a hybrid format Finally. on the 22nd and 23rd My of June 2021 at IPDJ, Lisbon Youth Centre, Portugal. The peer learning activity aims to bring together member states, young people, researchers and key players in the field of youth for an exchange of views on rethinking youth and youth policies aligned with a rights-based approach. A rights-based approach to youth policies is one of the main priorities of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union in the field of youth, in line with the EU Youth Strategy 2019-2027. In this framework, the Portuguese Institute of Sport and Youth and the European Commission, in cooperation with the European Youth Forum and the Portuguese National Youth Council, co-organized the Peer Learning Activity, PLA, a rights-based approach to youth policies in a hybrid format on the 22nd and 23rd of June 2021 at IPDJ, Lisbon News Centre, Portugal. The peer learning activity aims to bring together member states, young people, researchers and key players in the field of youth for an exchange of views on rethinking youth and youth policies aligned with a rights-based approach. Hello, good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, peer running activity co-organized with the presidency of Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union and the European Commission. I am Manuel Gil, uh, and together with my colleague uh, Sojana Pekovic, I'll be your moderator for these two days where we're going to discuss youth policy, what is the right paces approach, and how to incorporate it into member states and our general, and how to empower young people through this. Um, Today, the, the session will start with uh, some presentations from uh, some esteemed guests. We'll start with a message from uh, uh, the European Commission, from Temis Christofoulos, the Director of the um, Director General for Education, Youth and Sports, who kindly uh, sent us a message to inspire us for today's session. So, if you may pass the video. Thank you. I would like to thank the Portuguese Presidency and the European Youth Forum for focusing today's event on young people's access to rights. This is particularly relevant in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. We want to be inspired by your ideas. This is all the more crucial as young people are among the hardest hit by the crisis. 
I'm thinking in particular of the pandemic's consequences in terms of education, entry into the labor market, and mental health. At the Porto Social Summit in May, no doubt was left that the EU cares and is actively engaged in taking structural measures to turn the recovery into a promising future for all Europeans, young and old. Certainly, supporting youth is one of our key priorities in this context. As President von der Leyen stressed in her message on the 9th of May, we need to make social solidarity and social justice between generations. The EU youth strategy is a key instrument in this endeavor. It focuses on three main measures mobilizing, connecting, and empowering young people. Free and enabling young people to fully claim and enjoy their rights as EU citizens. This process is now being forced by the new European Youth Coordinator, who is a European Commission contact point and a visit reference for young people. This is important to ensure a cross sectoral perspective in the European Commission. The Union's new flagship programs, Erasmus Plus and the European Solidarity Fund, are here to provide new opportunities and empower young people. The new Erasmus Plus can open new doors for young people to acquire and develop all new technologies. initiatives in the digital opportunities and places. Not that. Not that. Not that. Not that. Not to say that the proposals under the new Erasmus Plus and the new European Solidarity are well underway and are attracting a lot of attention from the applicants. Climate change by investing more in projects aimed at raising awareness of environmental protection and working on concrete solutions to global climate challenges. And Erasmus Plus is providing financial incentives for participants to use sustainable means of transport, such as the railway. We wish to lead by example in this area. Last but not least, for the Conference on the Future of Europe, we want young people to have a strong say in it. The EU Youth Dialogue can contribute to bringing youths, young people's ideas to the table. Indeed, the European Youth Dialogue is a very powerful tool. It has played an important role in ensuring that young people can address the challenges related to access to rights and freedoms. I wish you fruitful discussions on these very important topics today. Thank you. Now, and many thanks for uh, Madam Temis Krisofidou for the kind words. As you know, this event today will be an hybrid event, so there will be participants taking part in uh, during during the Zoom call, but we have as well speakers who are present here in Lisbon. And now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Lucas Chambel, president of the Portuguese National Youth Council, uh, to board member of the Portuguese National Youth Council to uh, take the seat. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Manuel, for the for the floor. Um, and uh, good morning, Mr. Secretary of State of Youth and Sport, Jean-Paul Hville. Uh, good morning also to Ms. Temis Christofidou, Director General uh, for Education, Youth, Sports, Culture of the European Commission. And good morning to you all, ministerial and youth delegates. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to this uh, last event 
of the Portuguese presidents of the Council of the European Union in the field of youth, the peer learning activity on a rights-based approach to youth policies. During these two days, uh, we aim to discuss how we can ensure that policies are based on the rights of young people, as opposed to, the, to their needs. In a world where everything is constantly changing, we have a challenge here. As obstacles are evolving, so should the rights. Some years ago, we probably did not think that uh, there will be a right to disconnect or even the right to privacy. Furthermore, we are being confronted with a narrative and worryingly more often with actions that seek to restrain established civil and political rights that are the core, the core of our democracies. And once again, young people are at the forefront of these consequences. Nowadays, they are more critical than ever. And we as young people need to ensure that these rights are, these rights are upheld and ensured at the policy level and that sufficient instruments are in place to prevent us from stepping back instead of moving forward. A rights-based youth policy should strive to actively promote the emancipation of young people as well as their full participation in society. We cannot aspire for young people to be fully engaged and contribute to their communities if we don't acknowledge that they are subject to particular vulnerabilities um, that expose them to lifelong cycles of uh, poverty and social exclusion. And for that reason, they have to be addressed in a targeted, long-term, holistic and continuous way. Moreover, only if we ensure young people are involved in the decision-making process, we guarantee that our voice and our rights are assured in the policies. This involvement should also include our voice in the monitoring and evaluation of policies. Because one thing is what is written, written on a paper, meaning on a policy. Another is what happens in real life. So we need to ensure we are involved throughout all the process of decision-making. We hope that uh, during these two days, uh, two intense days, uh, we will be able to identify and reflect on a common understanding uh, of the concept of youth rights and right-based approach develop a set of recommendations for effective youth policy implementation and map good practices that are being implemented at different levels. So without exceeding my time much further, I would just like to finish by extending you a warm welcome and wish you fruitful discussions. Thank you for coming today and, uh, and tomorrow also for this uh, work that is very important for our youth. Thank you. No, and, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chambel, for the kind words. My apologies, you are the board member for international affairs, right? It's uh, my, our apologies for that slight mistake. Um, I, want to close the, I want to close this session to invite Mr. João Paulo Rubel, the Secretary of State of Youth and Sports, to take the stand. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Temis. I think uh, we are going to have a little problem here because they told me that we had the simultaneous translation and I have my speech in Portuguese. I'm not, uh, well, everybody who's uh, following us uh, by the internet should get the translation. I hope, oh, I can see that you are going to have translation also. Wow. Now I'm relieved because I was standing there looking at you, thinking no one is going to understand what I'm going to say because I didn't so the I didn't see the, the phones. Okay, Manuel Gil, muito obrigado pela sua presença e pela moderação que está aqui a fazer desta nossa atividade entre pares, uma abordagem das políticas de juventude baseada em direitos. Queria também saudar muito especialmente o Lucas Chambel, que está aqui em representação do Conselho Nacional de Juventude, que é nosso parceiro uma vez mais nesta atividade. Saudar o Carlos Pereira, 
é do Conselho Diretivo do Instituto de Esporte e da Juventude, como eu costumo dizer, o braço armado uh, da Secretaria de Estado da Juventude e do Desporto para uh, uh, a implementação das políticas de juventude, e na sua pessoa agradeço naturalmente a todo o Instituto e a todas as trabalhadoras e trabalhadores que têm sido incansáveis ao longo desta presidência portuguesa do Conselho da União Europeia. Vejo aqui o Max Trerro, queria saudá-lo muito especialmente também, é secretário-geral da OIJ, organismo ao qual Portugal com muito orgulho pertence e hoje assume especiais responsabilidades. Queria saudar de uma forma geral todos os participantes nesta, nesta sessão, o Fórum Europeu de Juventude, muito particularmente também, os diversos Conselhos Nacionais de Juventude, enfim, todos os jovens eh, que estão presentes nesta iniciativa eh, e que eh, estão eh, em pé de igualdade a querer discutir as, eh, um, as, eh, as políticas eh, nesta perspectiva eh, de, de uma abordagem eh, baseada em direitos eh, das políticas de, de juventude. Quero dizer-vos, eh, e queria antes de mais dar-vos as boas-vindas naturalmente, em nome de Portugal, hoje presidência portuguesa do Conselho da União Europeia, é esta atividade de aprendizagem entre pares. Em primeiro lugar, queria-vos agradecer a todas e a todos por terem aceito de facto este desafio, terem aceito este convite de fazer parte desta atividade. Queria expressar a minha satisfação por ver tantas e tantos participantes presencialmente aqui no Centro de Juventude de Lisboa, mas sobretudo e também online, que se juntam a nós a partir dos mais diversos países da União Europeia, e não só, diria eu, e a partir sobretudo também das mais diversas instituições. A presidência portuguesa do Conselho da União Europeia está quase a chegar ao seu fim, esta atividade de aprendizagem entre pares é na verdade a última atividade que promovemos na área da juventude, tem sido uma jornada e tanto, e estamos de facto muito orgulhosos de tudo o que conseguimos conquistar até agora. O tema que vos convido a discutir durante estes dois dias é a abordagem baseada nos direitos das políticas de juventude. É uma das duas principais prioridades da nossa presidência em matéria de juventude. Acreditamos firmemente que é hora de colocar este conceito e esta prática na ordem do dia e por isso no início do mês de maio promovemos um pequeno almoço informal e um debate político justamente sobre este tema no Conselho. Esta atividade de aprendizagem entre pares tem a mais alta importância neste percurso, visto que visa refletir sobre um entendimento comum do conceito, bem como sobre um conjunto de recomendações para a sua implementação, proporcionando também um conjunto de práticas promissoras que o aplicam a diferentes níveis e contextos. Em Portugal, a abordagem baseada nos direitos das políticas de juventude está de facto muito enraizada, desde logo no próprio cerne da nossa democracia. A Constituição da República Portuguesa tem um artigo específico, o artigo 70, dedicado aos direitos sociais, económicos e culturais da juventude. Desta forma, ao nível nacional, temos vindo a promover uma abordagem das políticas de juventude baseadas nos direitos e no âmbito da presidência portuguesa da União Europeia estamos empenhados em refletir sobre as possibilidades que existem ao nível da União Europeia. Entendemos que garantir o acesso dos jovens aos direitos é fundamental para a concretização das potencialidades de todas e de todos os jovens na sua plena diversidade, apoiando a realização de cada um e de cada uma no seu caminho individual de realização pessoal. A nossa Constituição orienta-nos, a nível nacional, no que diz respeito à definição dos direitos específicos e prioritários para a juventude, um grupo muito diverso de pessoas, como sabemos, que partilham uma situação de particular vulnerabilidade devido ao fator idade, mas que se encontram na fase de transição da dependência da infância para a autonomia da vida adulta. A promoção dos direitos de juventude, com a participação ativa das pessoas jovens, é para nós condição sine qua non que no desenvolvimento sustentável, não só a nível nacional, mas também a nível europeu e, portanto, também a nível global. Todos os Estados-membros da União Europeia estão comprometidos com o desenvolvimento sustentável, que não deixa ninguém para trás, e os direitos humanos constituem, de facto, um quadro para a promoção do bem-estar e do desenvolvimento. 
Os direitos humanos constituem um elemento fundamental do nosso conceito de democracia e de Estado de Direito. Recentemente, o Conselho adotou conclusões sobre a recuperação pós-Covid o aprofundamento das desigualdades e o aumento da pressão sobre as pessoas em situação vulnerável. As conclusões reafirmam que uma resposta socioeconómica com os direitos humanos, na sua essência, permitiria uma recuperação não só melhor, mas também, sobretudo, mais sustentável. As pessoas jovens, as associações de jovens e o setor da juventude em geral têm vindo a sofrer os impactos da pandemia de forma particularmente acentuada, como sabemos. Em primeiro lugar, os sucessivos confinamentos afetaram temporariamente diversos direitos e liberdades, mas infelizmente os impactos na juventude vão além disso. Mesmo assim, os jovens e o setor foram sempre, desde o início, parte da solução para os países da União Europeia. O questionário aplicado pela Presidência Portuguesa junto dos Estados-membros sobre os impactos da pandemia na juventude e no setor da juventude demonstrou que a maioria dos Estados-membros contou com a juventude como agente ativo nas respostas aos desafios da pandemia. Voluntários jovens prestaram o seu apoio junto às populações mais afetadas pela emergência médica, junto às pessoas vulneráveis, idosas ou pessoas em isolamento. Importa assim concluir, mais uma vez, que a participação jovem é uma grande mais-valia para as nossas sociedades. Eis mais um argumento que a reflexão sobre o pós-Covid deverá contar com a ampla participação da juventude. Permitam-me aqui ainda realçar que a participação das pessoas jovens na tomada de decisão é outra grande prioridade da presidência portuguesa da União Europeia em matéria de juventude. A participação é um dos direitos mais fundamentais em democracia, por isso a co-decisão e a co-gestão têm marcado a nossa atuação ao longo destes últimos seis meses. No caso desta atividade de aprendizagem entre pares, não podia ser de outra forma. Temos vindo a contar com a colaboração do Conselho Nacional de Juventude, bem como do Fórum Europeu de Juventude, no planeamento e na construção desta atividade. Tenho ainda muito gosto em verificar a ampla adesão das pessoas jovens a estas atividades. Acredito que esta reflexão só poderá ter impacto se contar naturalmente com a perspectiva da juventude. Um dos pontos altos da presidência portuguesa do Conselho da União Europeia foi a Cimeira Social, que decorreu no mês de maio, no Porto, onde os chefes de Estado da União Europeia afirmaram que vai ser dada prioridade a ações de apoio à juventude. Muito negativamente impactada pela crise do Covid-19, como já vimos, com ênfase nos domínios da educação, da formação e do trabalho. A declaração do Porto reconhece, mais uma vez, que os jovens são uma fonte indispensável de dinamismo, talento e criatividade para a Europa, com potencial para se tornarem a força motriz de recuperação inclusiva, verde e digital da construção da Europa do futuro. Portugal tem vindo a trabalhar a questão dos direitos da juventude não só ao nível da Europa. Ao longo dos próximos dois dias teremos a oportunidade de discutir boas práticas de outras áreas do globo. A Carta da Juventude da Comunidade dos Países de Língua Portuguesa por um lado, aprovada pela Conferência dos Ministros da Juventude e do Desporto daquela organização internacional, reconhece também os jovens como sujeitos políticos e também, evidentemente, sujeitos de direitos. Um dos grandes contributos do nosso país para a promoção dos direitos das pessoas jovens foi, como provavelmente muitos saberão, a Conferência Mundial de Ministros Responsáveis pela Juventude e o Fórum eh, de Mundial de Juventude, Lisboa Mais 21, onde representantes dos governos e da juventude afirmaram em conjunto os compromissos da Declaração Lisboa Mais 21. A grande maioria dos Estados-membros da União Europeia faz parte e fez parte desta conferência que coloca a promoção, proteção e efetivação dos direitos humanos das pessoas jovens em toda a sua diversidade no centro das políticas e programas de juventude. Em conclusão, importa reafirmar que o desenvolvimento da União Europeia só pode ser sustentável e justo entre as gerações se as políticas forem criadas com atenção específica ao acesso das pessoas jovens aos direitos na sua plena diversidade. Só assim, e com a participação efetiva da juventude, é que poderemos garantir que ninguém seja deixado para trás no processo de recuperação e desenvolvimento pós-pandemia e além Desta pós, deste pós-pandemia. Desejo-vos naturalmente um excelente trabalho, aguardo, e isto é muito importante, com expectativa, 
as conclusões desta uh, atividade de aprendizagem entre pares, é de facto um dos, uh, um, das coisas em que mais acredito, é uh, a aprendizagem entre pares, é sobretudo o que resulta desta vossa reflexão e o que resulta dos vários momentos, Conselho Nacional de Juventude, para ser justo, Federação Nacional das Associações de Juventude também em Portugal, que nos dão uns, os inputs eh, que dão no fundo aos decisores políticos, particularmente à Secretaria de Estado da Juventude e do Desporto, porque do fruto dessa vossa reflexão da juventude é que eu julgo que podemos efetivamente avançar, costumo dizer muitas vezes, e com isto termino, o nosso país, a nossa sociedade é uma sociedade mais pobre, sem a participação dos mais jovens, acreditamos que evidentemente a União Europeia é uma União Europeia mais pobre, se não tiver também a participação das pessoas jovens. Muito obrigado, desejo-vos sobretudo muito bom trabalho. Oh, many thanks, Madam Christophe Fidou, Mr. Rebel and Mr. Chambel for the, the kind words and for giving us already some food for thoughts about the European context, the programs that are being set up to empower young people through Erasmus, European Solidarity Corps, but also what's happening in Portugal and also in other regions, uh, mentioning Oijota, but also the CPLP, youth, um, youth Forum, so the, the role that other regions uh, can play in empowering young, uh, young people and also learning from them and their experiences. This will be as well part of our uh, uh, discussions during this PLA. And without further ado, I would like to move to our panel on uh, young people's access to rights and rights page approach, what and why, uh, which will be moderated by my colleague, Svajana Petkovic. And we're gonna have Flavia Colonese, Nana Pasic and Miriam Allen taking part. But uh, for the moment, thank you very much for uh, Jean Bell and Lucas to Chambel to be here. Please uh, thank them, and we can uh, move to the next panel. And now the ladies. Uh, I guess so. So I would like to welcome you all from my side as well. Uh, my name is Laja and uh, I'm a senior youth researcher, member of the pool of European youth researchers, and also very happy to be able to support uh, this event from an evidence-based approach, I would say. So I'm gonna moderate the session, which is going to bring us a food for thought. Um, as you probably know, we have prepared a lot of uh, material for you to read ahead of this uh, event. Uh, so let's hope that you had uh, uh, a bit of time at least to take a look. Otherwise, uh, we are going to have a very distinguished and uh, respective panelists this morning with us. And I really uh, would like to say a warm welcome, uh, first of all, with Flavia from the um, uh, European Youth Forum that is sitting here with me, but also we have two lovely speakers and panelists uh, joining, joining us online. We have Lana Pasic from uh, the Pool of European, uh, uh, basically the, the partnership between the uh, European uh, Union and Council of Europe in the field of youth, and also Miriam Allen. All oh, lovely to have you with us. <laughs> Ladies, I have to say that 
it's quite weird and uh, honestly for me the first time to take part in this uh, hybrid event but uh, in a way we are learning to do things right so let's move on thank you all for being us uh, for being with us this morning thank you all for taking the time and also for your material and quality inputs uh, just for the participants, uh, I would like to say a few words about the content that you are going to share. So basically, this panel uh, is going to answer the key questions uh, which are important for our learning process. Some of these questions are related to the concept of youth, youth rights, and how it's been implemented in practice, right? Especially when, when it comes to youth policy context. Then we are going to discuss a bit about challenges um, and maybe we are going to mention some tools and ways uh, to overcome them. But the good news is also that we are going to have plenty of time today and also tomorrow to work on these questions. We are going to reflect on many um, questions and topics that we have prepared uh, for you. So uh, I suggest that we start with, uh, with the partnership. So Lana, I'm going to give the floor to you to basically start um, explaining about, let's say, the concept and access uh, to um, rights-based approach and how is, um, how is it relevant for young people and what actually the partnership is doing um, in this regard. Please. Thank you very much, Slavia. Uh, I hope the sound is okay. Uh, as you said, the hybrid events are always uh, tricky ones to to know if everything is working and if uh, if you can actually hear me. Um, so thanks, uh, and it's really great to to attend uh, even uh, virtually. Uh, and I think it's uh, one of my uh, first. Is it Lana, sorry, just to double check. No, I'm. Okay, uh... let's check the sound once again. Can you hear well, me now? We've got used to these situations, right? <laughs> Absolutely. The first, uh, yeah, the first sentence is always, are you muted? Please unmute yourself. <laughs> and then. Uh, I'm unmuted. So just checking again if you can hear me. OK. We have our lovely technical team that is helping us. Is it better, is it better now? now? Yes. Yeah, it's uh, the trick of uh, muting and unmuting myself again so these are some technical okay. tips as well <laughs> okay super thanks again as i said it's always uh, nice to to attend uh, one of these events even if it's virtually and the uh, hybrid events are always a bit tricky to know if uh, you can hear me and see me but we we cross that bridge and that hurdle now so <laughs> We can start with uh, with our presentation. So my name is Lana Pasic. I'm a youth research and policy officer at the Youth Partnership. And as Slaja mentioned, uh, we have uh, done quite a lot of research on uh, young people's rights and access to rights. Uh, so maybe just a br very brief introduction for those who do not know what we do uh, so the role of the the youth partnership is to bring together three sides of the triangle so youth research youth policy and youth work youth work practice uh, while uh, also uh, putting young me young people at the center of this uh, triangle or as now we refer to it as a as a pyramid um, and uh, there are some key themes and objectives that we covered at the partnership throughout the years. Uh, there are uh, youth participation and democratic citizenship, social inclusion, and strengthening youth work. And uh, we will uh, show now how all of these actually relate to the topic of uh, rights-based approach and uh, young people's access to rights. There are also many other uh, uh, other projects and activities that we, that we cover, uh, and some of them are also uh, in the last uh, year and a half uh, now related with the response to uh, to the COVID crisis through our knowledge hub. Okay, so how do we do this? Uh, how do we gather all this knowledge and data, uh, basically? So we have a really amazing uh, networks uh, that we work with. Uh, so one is the pool of European youth researchers and uh, its associated advisory group that Slaja is a member of, uh, and also the European Knowledge Center for Youth Policy. So through these networks, we gather uh, knowledge, evidence, and data about the situation of young people across Europe uh, and also identify 
identify some priorities uh, for both policy and practice. So where does this take us uh, when it comes to the right-based approach and young people's access to rights? So in the past, uh, not only a few years, I would say, but uh, going quite some time back as well, uh, there has been an extensive research on mapping the barriers to social inclusion of young people and uh, can, how can young people actually find uh, their way uh, through, through European societies uh, and to kind of uh, get access to certain rights, first to learn about the rights that they have uh, and then also to be able to actually access them and claim them um, and then this has also uh, sorry just to check the the sound is okay this has also led us uh, to look into the specific categories of young people uh, which often face barriers uh, more barriers than others and also the concepts such as intersectionality uh, where young people from certain groups are uh, often facing multiple disadvantages uh, so we had uh, research as well then on social inclusion and access to rights uh, linked with digitalization. Uh, so we published uh, various uh, reports, studies, knowledge books, insights, uh, as well as podcasts. Uh, and uh, this access to rights uh, in the digital environment has uh, become particularly important uh, over the last year or a little bit more than a year now uh, and then one of the topics as well that was uh, quite important for the Portuguese presidency is the that of youth participation and uh, also young people's right to participate and as mentioned there as well we have produced several studies and uh, now we are working on the knowledge book and papers on access to rights, the right to assembly, uh, the shrinking space for young people's participation across Europe, as well as compendiums of practices, uh, videos uh, and podcasts. So when it comes to young people's participation, and this is uh, also something that uh, in the introduction uh, uh, it was mentioned that uh, young people need to be included in making decisions, making policies and also evaluating them. So I decided then to start uh, with this question of participation uh, when it comes to the rights. Uh, so. Uh, not only is it healthy uh, and important uh, for a democracy to have young people taking part uh, in decision making and policy making, but it's important also to recognize what this participation depends on and uh, how is it motivated. Uh, so first, young people are more likely to participate and claim their rights if they feel that there is an opportunity, that they are equally treated, uh, that they are heard, and that also their participation actually has an impact. But it also depends on uh, various socioeconomic factors. Uh, it depends on gender and it depends on democratic environment. Um, so why is it important to, to highlight these, uh, these different aspects is to mention that, uh, of course, uh, access to rights and uh, rights-based approach um, to young people's participation uh, needs to really consider uh, different groups of young people, their backgrounds, uh, when we talk about gender, uh, especially in the context of participation, young women are often participating less, uh, except when it comes to, for example, climate movements where we have over uh, over representation if we can use such a word uh, of young people participating there uh, but also when it comes to young people from rural and urban areas uh, for example uh, young people from different ethnic groups uh, as well as uh, young people from different socioeconomic groups so uh, when we look at the participation, uh, there are different uh, ways uh, in which participation can be can be understood. Uh, so different aims, uh, let's say, or why young people uh, participate in, in policy making, why they are included uh, by the governments or by decision makers. And some of these are uh, development approach or empowerment and efficiency. And these basically mean that uh, participation is uh, viewed as young people's uh, way of learning the democratic and citizenship skills about giving them a kind of an opportunity to vo vo voice their uh, their views and priorities and the efficiency argument uh, looks at it as a way of uh, young people 
actually contributing to policy so that policies are uh, meaningful and they respond to the needs. Uh, but the fourth approach, the rights-based approach, is the one that uh, is of, uh, of uh, relevance uh, to, the, to this event. Um, looks at the participation as something that uh, young people have a right to uh, and therefore uh, they need to be included in making decisions. So in which context uh, are these different approaches or different rights then claimed? Uh, so first we can have a look at the conventional ways of participation. So young people often through legal uh, systems have a right to vote, uh, they have a right to run for elections, they have a right to be members of political parties, to sign petitions, uh, then um, in most European countries, there's also a right to form a youth council, to participate in one, to participate in student unions, etc., or to um, have a bit more influence on actual uh, kind of implementation of certain decisions to participate rebudgeting, for example. And uh, this is particularly a strong way of uh, young people's participation in Portugal because uh, there are a lot of examples of how participatory budgeting is done uh, in various municipalities and cities there. Uh, but then uh, when young people feel that uh, their right to participation in this way is not necessarily respected or they feel invisible, then often they turn to a different way of participation. Uh, so claiming their rights uh, through some unconventional ways. Uh, and these are often uh, particular to certain topics such as climate change, gender equality, racial justice, student rights. Uh, and uh, this type of participation takes place through social movements, protests, demonstrations, uh, flash mobs, uh, certain disruptive actions, and we have really been seeing uh, a lot of this type of participation uh, when it comes to the climate justice movement uh, over the last few years. Okay, uh, so our study on political participation identified kind of certain ways of meaningful engagement of young people and meaningful youth participation because rights-based approach uh, really needs to look at uh, what what are what makes sense uh, to young people. So yes, young people have a right to participate uh, and they have a right to to make decisions to contribute to policy making, uh, but how to ensure that this is really done meaningfully that the decisions that are uh, uh, that are made actually reflect the priorities of young people. Uh, so I will not go into the details uh, of this uh, of this illustration. Uh, you can find it on our website uh, and also soon in the study. But there are some questions that can help uh, decision makers at various levels, uh, also for example within organizations, uh, to have a look at it and uh, really evaluate uh, how they involve young people and uh, what are some of the steps that can be done. Um, so maybe just to touch upon a little bit on this uh, question of challenges that Slaja raised that other panelists will also touch upon later. Um, so we have different ways uh, in which uh, rights-based approach to, to youth policies and participation can be encouraged. But uh, realities are often uh, uh, a bit different. Uh, so what we have been seeing is that uh, this uh, right of young people to participate or right to access uh, different social, economic and political rights is often limited uh, by various uh, uh, but various obstacles and some of these are financial uh, so for example cut in the funding uh, for youth uh, youth activities or youth centers or uh, uh, youth councils then we have uh, legal limitations as well uh, where uh, in certain countries we are seeing uh, for example criminalization of youth activism uh, criminalization of protests then uh, also there are limits sometimes to youth spaces um, and this refers to both physical and virtual spaces um, and it's important here to mention and uh, it's uh, it's interesting to me to, to raise this question in an all-female panel uh, which is not very often seen. Uh, it's the gendered nature of spaces uh, and uh, often certain spaces are quite limited and uh, there was a lot of research done also by our pool of, uh, of researchers in terms of the spaces that young women can access and cannot access and how welcomed or not welcomed they are there. Uh, 
Uh, then we also had uh, uh, a research done on young people's right to assembly and uh, having looked through the cases uh, at the European Court of Human Rights as well, uh, we can see that uh, this right has actually been strongly violated over the last few years and that many youth organizations and young people fear uh, when it comes to, to the right to assembly to claim their rights. And then, of course, we have a selective priority. So this sometimes can mean that uh, there is a p policy priority given to, for example, uh, service provision as opposed to the activities that might be more challenging uh, certain policies and decisions. Uh, so what can be done? Uh, I had a, we had a look at the challenges. Uh, so how to ensure uh, some of the uh, how to ensure the rights-based approach uh, is actually respected. Um, so I start here with uh, with one of the infographics from the study. Uh, so maybe first to look at the rights-based approach in the context of participation. Uh, so there are five five main things uh, that have been identified by, by the researchers here, uh, and they refer to first ensuring transparency and accountability uh, when it comes to young people's participation, giving them a voice and authority, ensuring open communication channels, ensuring power sharing between young people uh, and adults, and uh, also providing material and non-material support. Um, and this, uh, all of these points actually uh, connect quite well with the challenges that, uh, that I mentioned earlier. Then there is a need to ensure uh, safe spaces for young people, as I said, both physical, virtual, and now uh, we also have hybrid uh, safe spaces for youth. Um, and then uh, there should be more attention given to uh, to the rights and access to rights for particular categories of young people. So here uh, we mentioned, for example, women in conventional representative democracy. And then um, inclusion of youth movements into the discussion, uh, because this is co the conventional participation often uh, is done through certain uh, certain kind of well-established methods and well-known methods of politics. Uh, but we have seen that young people uh, really want to explore different types of participation, and they're more active in movements. Um, so the states uh, and the youth organizations as well, uh, and different institutions need to acknowledge this and bring youth movements into the discussion when it comes to, to policy making. And of course, uh, quite importantly, destigmatization and decriminalization of youth activists, uh, which are uh, working on claiming the rights uh, of young people and kind of advocating uh, for youth priorities. Uh, so that is a kind of in a nutshell uh, years of our research on this topic. And I'm sure you will have uh, more questions in that. Thanks. I have seen that uh, uh, that our research has already been shared with participants, so you can also find it uh, on our website. Uh, so thank you, Slaja. I pass back to you. Thank you very much, Lana. This was uh, really essential food for thought, I would say, for our participants. Uh, I mean, participating from both sides for those sitting here with us, but also for the people joining online. So we learned a lot about how the key RBA principles are actually tackled. Uh, we learned about the evidence. We learned about uh, the importance of uh, building a youth policy based on uh, knowledge, right? So I strongly uh, encourage uh, our uh, learners to take a look, to uh, go back to our resources, to check the partnership slide and really to make the best use of the information available. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, guys, I forgot to mention, but uh, I'm pretty sure that we are already experts in Zooming, right? So if you have a few uh, questions, please uh, choose um, the small box uh, Q&A on the bottom of your screen and uh, post the question. If you like to post your question uh, like um, online, <laughs> Uh, you can raise your virtual hand and then our dear uh, colleague Manuel is going to give you the floor. So you can join us uh, this way as well. Now we are going to move on to the policy uh, context. And thank you very much, Miriam, for being here with us. 
Um, we are really, really happy to uh, hear the OECD's uh, perspective on how exactly uh, the, the youth rights could be implemented and should be indeed implemented in the policy context. And what would you say what the evidence uh, is telling us about the main challenges in this regard? The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Slatiana. Um, I uh, don't know if, if someone displays my presentation, otherwise I can also do that, uh, just to ask the app desk. Um, I can share my screen. Well, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Great. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Slatiana, and also let me thank uh, the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the EU and um, uh, Secretary of State, Mr. Rebello, for their kind invitation. And I would also like to thank, of course, the Portuguese Institute of Sports and Youth, and here in particular, um, Paolo and, and George for, for their excellent collaboration. I'm very happy to participate in this event today um, in this peer learning. As you know, OECD strongly believes in peer, peer learning. Actually, the very term peer review, peer learning was coined by the OECD back in the 70s. Um, and I'm representing the OECD Public Governance uh, Directorate, where we conduct work on use uh, uh, from the governance perspective, governance arrangement perspective to empower young people and also to promote intergenerational justice. Uh, we have heard it already today many times, young people are citizens in their own rights. They should not be seen as a passive receivers of public services. That's, I think, very important, but they should be rather seen as active right holders. And uh, the COVID-19 crisis has increased the challenges as uh, faced by young people, as was pointed out um, by, by all our speakers, um, not only to exercise their rights, but also to, to transition to autonomous life. Our youth COVID paper uh, that was presented uh, a couple of months ago makes it clear um, young people have been hit hard by the crisis and uh, director general mentioned the main points mental health has issues of mental health has increased issues in education and employment but we at the OECD we are also trying to quantify the impact of that and when it comes to employment uh, to education I would really like to uh, cite one of the figures that our colleagues from the employment directorate has come up with we are estimating that a loss school year can lead to a loss of between seven and ten percent of lifeline lifetime income so it really has a long-term effect what you are doing today has a long-term effect for, uh, for 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 the people in the long run and uh, youth access to participation opportunities will of course be critical for the response and recovery as has pointed out by all our participants but again, in the OECD, we are trying to what it actually means in practice to have this meaningful participation, as Lana was saying, but also what is the impact of this uh, engagement? Can we really show that it matters or is it just a nice to have or not a must to have? And our analysis is very clear that when young people are engaged in policy making, they also tend to be more satisfied with government's performance. So we have data that really shows this correlation. And obviously, this has consequences for the overall trust level. And I would like to really recall that already before the crisis, young people were less likely than their parents to feel that they have an impact on what the government does. In 2020 now, less than 50% of young people trust their governments across OECD countries. And let's face it, without trust, no policy, no reform will be sustainable enough to build the future that our citizens want. So really, it is a strategic necessity to engage young people in the policy making. It's not, uh, not an option. Uh, this historical moment makes it uh, crucial for governments to recognize, and protect, and promote youth rights and promote fair policy outcome across generation. So we, in the OECD, we are putting very much emphasis on this intergenerational aspect. And why is this the case? Because we can show in our data and our analysis that countries, uh, there was a ring? You can hear me, no? Yeah. 
um, that countries uh, where age-related inequalities are smaller, overall life satisfaction is higher. And of course, there's nothing else and better to achieve than happiness with your satisfaction with your life. As you can see in the background, the OECD slogan is better policies for better lives. And age-related inequalities, the lower they are, the higher you have satisfaction with uh, life in society. Governments can mainstream right-based approaches in their youth policy strategies at national level, as we have seen in many countries. And so to reply to your question uh, on what, uh, what to do, let me share some, some key findings from our recent uh, report that we call Governance for Youth and Trust in Intergeneral Justice, and where we ask what governments need to do to, deliver, to be fit for all generations. Uh, the, the report represents a comparative benchmark of 42 countries where we look at institutions, strategies, laws, uh, governance policy tools put in place by 42 member countries of uh, 42 countries of uh, many of them are EU member countries. We also actually asked the Commission itself, so they have also replied to our survey. Um, and I would like to present um, some of the results of the study. So here is uh, finding number one, where we ask youth association about their priorities uh, or concerns and where they are most satisfied with government services. And, and the message is, uh, is very clear. Across uh, a number of, of areas, young people find it increasingly difficult to achieve some of the major classical milestone of adulthood. This raises questions of whether youth have access to public services of quality and whether policies and services are responsive to their needs. On this slide, you see that uh, youth-led organizations tend to have, uh, 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 tend to show great satisfaction with government performance in the area of uh, sports, uh, culture, leisure, but also in the area of youth rights and human rights, but they are less convinced and less happy with public services in the field of housing and employment, for instance. Uh, and we all know that um, you cannot treat one uh, issue area, sectoral area, without also taking into account the other ones. Housing and employment, for sure, are interrelated. But the question at the end, uh, as Lana was also saying, is how can we um, um, approach uh, use policy from a more holistic integrated approach. And, um, and what we have seen in the OECD, in OECD countries, is, um, is that 76% um, uh, of our member countries, too, so over two thirds of OECD countries have adopted a national use strategy to move towards a more integrated holistic approach towards youth policy. And actually three out of four uh, of these, uh, youth, uh, these youth strategies, and you can see this on this slide, feature active commitments on uh, actions for youth rights. So you see that here in the, in the right bar, um, youth participation, almost all strategies include, and youth rights, three out of four, uh, which is also quite a lot. Uh, including, by the way, also Portugal. In your national use plan, you have commitments for use rights. Um, but including specific commitments and actions on use rights within national use strategies can, can help the effective implementation, for sure. But the question is, um, what, what are the key levers to ensure that this uh, implementation is really effective or is just on paper? And here I would like to show finding number three, where we show the major challenges of countries implementing a national use strategy. And in fact, uh, only 20% of the national use strategies uh, in OECD countries are fully participatory, budgeted, monitored, and evaluated. A lack of resources, monitoring, and evaluation can limit the effectiveness of, uh, of including use rights within them. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see our benchmark of national use strategies and on top you see Estonia um, and um, and on the left you see 
the set of good governance principles against which we have uh, assessed these national use strategies. And even among the top performing countries, uh, even among the top performing government, challenges persist in the coordination across different ministries uh, and also in the understanding of policy, uh, of how policies and budget allocations affect young people, people's opportunities. Uh, to do this, uh, to have a, a meaningful national strategy, you need, of course, data. You cannot tackle what we, uh, you cannot measure. And we see that 36% um, of ministries in charge of youth affairs in OECD countries uh, report that they are still facing huge challenges in collecting, collecting age disaggregated data on human rights and youth rights. I would like now to turn to the uh, fourth finding. Beyond national youth strategies, a right-based approach for young people and future generation can also be ensured through other governance tools. And here in particular, we have looked at specific ombudsman institutions. And 19 uh, OECD countries have created such a specific ombudsman uh, for youth rights at national, national and regional level. And another 11 countries have created dedicated offices with the National Ombudsman Office or, with, uh, or, in, or they included youth affairs as pa part of uh, their mandate. And the competencies of these ombudspersons and commissions differ widely, but they fulfill an important function as independent oversight institution to protect and promote uh, the rights of children and young people. Innovative developments are also emerging uh, around rights of future generations. For instance, in at least eight OECD countries, including Portugal, by the way, uh, they, these countries have enshrined the rights of future generation in their constitutions through clauses related to general ecological or financial matters. In alleged, uh, uh, alleged violations of the rights of future generation, have also been brought to courts. So you have probably witnessed, uh, followed the, the recent developments in Germany, but also in the Netherlands, Norway, and the UK, among others. In a nutshell, um, a right based, a youth right based approach can, uh, can be integrated in policy making through various ways. Uh, I have uh, pointed to the national strategies, youth strategies, but also through institutional arrangements and specific governance tools. But at the end, and I think that's also the main takeaway, uh, these invest, uh, investments in their uh, investment in their design and in the resources and in the monitoring and evaluation, something that Lucas had, has prominently mentioned in his opening, in his very powerful opening remarks, uh, will be critical uh, for the implementation to really translate words into action. And with this, uh, I would like to finish my short presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, I would say that this was really um, kind of the essence that our learners uh, need to hear and needed to hear this morning uh, to inspire their further discussion and uh, overall, you know, this uh, learning uh, activity and especially transfer of knowledge from uh, one context to another. Thank you also, Anna and Miriam, for uh, kind of making very concrete and specific references uh, to Portugal and Portuguese reality, but also uh, to the youth policy, let's say, uh, in general, and uh, also how the governance plays the role in uh, implementing the rights-based approach. Uh, I just have to say that it's not uh, very often to, you know, be able to um, have access to data telling us not uh, not only how things are in general when it comes to implementation uh, of particular um, approaches into youth policy context, but uh, to actually have facts and figures on how particular principle is implemented and embedded in the youth policy um, framework. I would say that these data are very valuable to us. And uh, I would say that this event also um, has a really, really good momentum, I would say. Uh, we should really build on both of this, on having the data in one way and having really the opportunity to influence uh, the, the further developments in this area. It's also good to mention that uh, the, as 
of course, uh, has been mentioned already in the introductory speeches that uh, the European Commission and uh, our respective partner institutions in the youth field are already uh, doing a lot and accepting a lot uh, of, uh, let's say, political and policy documents to support uh, these processes. But uh, in the end, I would just uh, like to also give the floor to Flavia and to see uh, how things are going in practice. <laughs> Could you please yeah, give us a bit of uh, insight uh, on the health of the youth organizations and the challenges that they are facing, and maybe on how the, the European Youth Forum is actually seeing implementation of youth uh, rights-based approach. I know that uh, you are doing a lot in this context. Indeed. And thank you for being with us as well. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's great to actually be for the first time after a year and a half in a in a physical event, it uh, really changes the, the perspective entirely. It's, uh, it's, good to be, it's good to be back. Uh, so thank you for, for having me. Um, I first want to briefly introduce myself and the European Youth Forum. I know that the vast majority of the people that are in front of me today here in, uh, in Lisbon know about us and, and what we do, but perhaps some of the people following us online are not as familiar with the, with the European Youth Forum. So yeah, so my name is Flavia Colonese. I'm a policy and advocacy manager at the, at the European Youth Forum, and we are the largest umbrella uh, of youth organizations in, uh, in Europe. We have more than 100 members all over the, the continent, also beyond the European Union. And what we do is we, we advocate for the interests and rights of young people in Europe. And we do that by uh, working on many different uh, policy areas from uh, employment to social rights, uh, participation, uh, climate and sustainable development. And what we try to, uh, to work towards too is building a fair, uh, sustainable, and uh, socially just Europe, where youth rights are uh, protected, respected, and fulfilled. So already from my words, I think you can tell that the rights-based approach is one of the guiding principles of the, uh, of the work of the, of the European Youth Forum. So happy to be here today to share some of our thoughts in terms of uh, how things are going when it comes to, to youth rights and the rights-based approach in, uh, uh, in Europe. Um, I think you know one of the questions that you shared with me in preparation for this panel was, uh, why it's important to, um, to ensure that young people have, have access to their rights and uh, why it's important to implement a rights-based approach to, to youth. And I think the really question is, how could it not be important? You know, at the end of the day, uh, when we're speaking about youth rights, I think it's important to just understand that what we're talking about is human rights, human rights of young people. And it's, uh, it's rights uh, that we are entitled to as, as human beings for merely existing on, on this planet. And of course, the concept can can evolve as Lucas from the National Youth Council of Portugal has mentioned because things change over time and we need to uh, keep up with that in terms of policy and, and legislation, but fundamentally we're speaking about human rights. Um, the other layer uh, here when we speak about youth rights is just understanding how uh, being young and being in traditional phase between childhood and education and, 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 and adulthood uh, from uh, uh, dependency to, uh, to independence can obviously provide additional obstacles and, uh, uh, and barriers to, uh, to accessing rights. And so that means that we need to do something more in terms of policies and measures to make sure that young people can actually have access to, uh, to those rights. And the rights-based approach obviously is an important tool to do exactly, exactly this. But when it comes to, to the implementation, to the actual reality in, in practice, obviously things are a little bit different and a little bit challenging. And you know, a lot of different speakers have mentioned the, the COVID-19 crisis and the, and the impact that it has had on, on young people. And I think that's, that's a very good example as to why things haven't worked as well as they should have so far, I would say. Um, you know, if, if we look at what happened over the past year and a half, you know, we've heard a lot about young people being the lockdown generation. We've heard about you know, young people being disproportionately affected by this crisis, both in the short and the long run. But is it surprising? Is, how can we be surprised by this when the result, uh, what we're facing now in terms of the situation that young people are going through is just a result of like a decade of, you know, not really doing enough for, for young people and, uh, and for their rights. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, the crisis that we're seeing now is just the, the consequence of years of, of policies where uh, they haven't supported really young people to, uh, to become independent and to, and to thrive, you know. Um, it's, uh, it's been years that youth unemployment has been disproportionately higher compared to the unemployment rate for the rest of the population. It's been years that transitions from education to employment have been longer and, and harder. It's been years that young know, people have been caught up in cycles of precarious work and, uh, and, and jobs, and that has led to you know, uh, a higher risk of poverty and, and social exclusion for, uh, for young people. 
uh, again, uh, social protection systems for years, they've been um, limiting access to, to young people in terms of young people not being able to get, you know, social safety nets and uh, income support because of their age or their employment status. So it's, it's a problem that it's been there for a long time. We cannot be surprised by uh, the impact that this crisis is having at this, uh, at this stage. And so we need to, to learn from this. But how are we learning? Uh, it's a bit of a question mark. The European Youth Forum has just uh, released, has just launched a new, a new report. Uh, it's called um, Beyond Lockdown, the Pandemic Scar on Young People that I uh, encourage everyone to, uh, to check out. And what the report does is beyond you know, providing data and, uh, um, and uh, an overview of how the pandemic has impacted young people on in terms of work, in terms of uh, mental health and, and education, and what the longer term consequences of this could be, what it does, it also it provides an analysis uh, of the policy responses at national level and, and European international level so far when it comes to supporting young people through this crisis. And I think the results there are quite striking. What it came out of that research is that when it comes to employment, uh, less than 1% of all measures, economic measures being taken at national level actually are directed specifically at young people. Less than 1%, we're talking around 10 out of thousands. It's, it's, it's quite striking. I want you to reflect on the numbers. When it comes to education, what we found out is that, you know, understandably, the measures being taken were about, you know, uh, closing schools and, and trying to deal with the immediate impact of the pandemic. But why aren't we asking ourselves what to do in terms of, you know, making up for the loss of learning that we've seen over the, over the past year and a half? We need to think longer term. When it comes to mental health, again, a huge impact on, on young people that is going to have longer term consequences. And yet, our research has showed that there's no specific policy measure that is trying to deal with the, um, the impact on, on young people's mental health of, of the year that it's been. So again, we need to act now and do better to try and, and avoid, you know, 10 years from now having another meeting of this kind and questioning uh, what's been happening and what we need to do better. So I think we need to take a moment to, to learn the lessons from, from what happened so far, how we dealt with the previous crisis in 2008 and how we're going to be dealing with this, with this new one that is going to have, uh, that's going to affect young people more than, more than other groups. Um, and the rights-based approach, I think, is the very first step that we can, that we can take. Um, I think through the rights-based approach, we can try and change the narrative around youth and, and policymaking when it comes to, to youth rights. We can start focusing a little bit more on the longer term rather than short term measures that just deal with the immediate needs, we can try and tackle really the root causes of, uh, uh, of injustice and uh, of, of exclusion. We can, uh, through the rights based approach, uh, hold policymakers accountable for their action of, or lack thereof. And, um, and last but not least, we can really engage with the rights holder, so young people. Uh, much more in a much more coherent and structured way that we've done uh, so far, which I think is really important. You know, we've had several speakers mentioning youth participation and how that needs to be to be meaningful. And of course, that's uh, that's absolutely absolutely true, and that has to be the uh, the way forward for policy making that actually is successful and effective in supporting young people. I think. Thank you very much, Claudia. <laughs> Indeed. Thanks a lot. Uh, just to wrap up in a way, and then we are going to give floor for your um, respective Q questions uh, for the Q&A. I just want to reflect on the fact that um, the partnership indeed uh, uh, built and developed the platform that is uh, called the COVID-19 Knowledge Hub, which um, uh, contains plenty of uh, studies, including some of the the, the ones produced by the European Youth Forum, but also the OECD and many of these uh, materials we have mentioned today. But also we are going to share throughout the event uh, additional knowledge sources with you, if you like to learn more, of course. Um, and one of the, let's say, um, findings indeed um, that the team of researchers uh, come up with is that um, the COVID obviously just amplified the, the existing challenges, the existing gaps when it comes to policy making, uh, when it comes to um, kind of implementing the right based approach, let's say, um, in, in the youth policy field. So I would say that uh, one of the things that we need to bear in mind and definitely need to address in more participatory manner is also, as you mentioned, related to youth transitions and how can we act now uh, not in the 10 years time because uh, the 
the consequences are serious, I would say, and we need to take uh, things seriously. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you really uh, lovely ladies and our respective panelists for your quality inputs. I'm pretty sure that uh, the, the learners and our participants are going to benefit uh, from your um, data and uh, we will make sure that uh, the data is also available to them throughout the event. So Manuel, over to you if there are some questions coming from our participants. Thank you very much uh, for all the, the panelists. Currently, we don't have questions uh, virtually, but maybe here present in Lisbon, you might have uh, yeah. some questions. So please raise your hands if you have one and we'll lend you a microphone. So no virtual, uh, no virtual hands. Yeah, don't be shy. No virtual hands. You can actually raise your hand. <laughs> That's the good news, finally. Any questions, guys? Yeah. There's a question here. Please. Take a mic. Hello, my name is Marius. My question goes to Flavia. I'd be interested, Flavia, with the um, rights-based approach, what is the biggest thing or the most important thing we need to do for it to really matter? Right, that's a, that's a big question, I would say. A million dollar <laughs> question to start with. No, it's a great question. Um, I think the rights-based approach, uh, you know, the, the focus needs to really be on, on really understanding that young people are rights holders and all that, you know, comes with that, I would say. So I really have a better understanding of who young people are uh, as, a, as a group. Uh, with, you know, the institutional dimension, I think that's the, the data aspect that you mentioned is, is very important. But also that, you know, if they, are, they have rights, if they are rights holders, then we need policies and we need those policies to be legally binding and we need uh, policymakers to be, to be accountable. And we need to really understand what the issues are uh, and we need to try and go in terms of policymaking beyond what I think is traditionally defined as, as youth policy. You know, uh, young people's rights relate to many different aspects of, of their lives, you know, from employment, housing, social protection, education, participation. And so by definition, youth rights are cross-cutting. And so policy measures need to be cross-cutting as well. We can't really you know, lock ourselves up in, in youth policy, uh, traditionally speaking. We need to try and mainstream youth rights in all policy measures that are relevant uh, to young people, even if they're not specifically targeted at, at young people. We, try, we need to try and, and understand how, can, and how will a policy uh, impact on, on youth rights? Is it gonna be working for young people? What are going to be the challenges? We need to have this thinking beforehand so that we make policies that are more that are more effective and that can really support young people in uh, in accessing their, their rights and in uh, you know supporting their inclusion in the in the long run. If I may add uh, um, to follow up on this, uh, uh, our today's uh, breakout sessions are actually going to be focused on um, empowering young people as the right uh, holders, right? And tomorrow we are going to address uh, issues that are more tackling youth uh, policymakers as, as duty bearers, you know, as those uh, who are supposed to be accountable. So I would say that um, all of these inputs uh, would, would really help us to build a bit further and uh, to come up uh, hopefully with some concrete uh, uh, recommendations until the end of the event. Any other questions? Yes, please. The mic is coming. Uh, hello, my name is Pete. Uh, first, let me comment that I'm very excited to see only a women-based uh, panel, and especially on the topic and also focusing on research. I think I've missed a little bit online or face-to-face this type of panels and thank you very much for putting it in the program uh, to to say like as a person as a young person the process of rights-based approach in youth policy is vital but what we see now with the crisis a lot of member states facing a crisis of democracy and participation so we're kind of on a double process here in integrating a right-based approach on youth policy but the other process is ensuring rights and protection of rights in general. 
So as experts, what do you suggest that we should do as young people to make sure that we protect democracy? But on the other uh, part, what should member states be aware to ensure that they do maintain quality of democracy? Thank you. Thank you very much for a question. Would you like to pass your question to uh, some particular? Yeah. Ladies, whoever is ready. I'm happy to leave yeah, the floor. Yeah, yeah. Also, also, I could share, sorry, um, one association. Alana, you mentioned very interesting thing that uh, basically in this, uh, and thank you very much for the question. It, it's really brilliant, I would say, uh, that we um, makes us aware of this uh, complex reality, right? We are not dealing only with one issue, but we need to have the background in mind as well. And Lana, you mentioned very uh, interesting thing that actually the crisis, especially when it comes to uh, green agenda, right? And, uh, you know, these alternative ways or ways of being um, active in the society really kind of created additional space for young people. So maybe we could... Uh, later on follow up on this if you if you like but please Flavia. no i wanted to ask if the other speakers actually wanted to intervene because i've been speaking a lot but i think you know obviously as as lana said you know there are as you mentioned as well there are many uh ways in which young people try and, and really push for a positive change beyond you know institutional participation i think you know even when it comes to fighting for democracy young people are, are always going to be at the at the forefront and, and fighting for for a better society and a more democratic society for, for everyone. But I think it's also important not to leave young people alone in this, in this fight. Uh, at the European Youth Forum, we've been trying to work a little bit more on the shrinking civic space for, uh, for young people in, uh, uh, in Europe. And I think, you know, um, it's, one of the, it's gonna be one of the key topics, I think, for the, for the years to come, you know, because the barriers to, to participation, to civic space when it comes to youth can come left, right and center. They can, be very, you know, out there explicit, but they also can be indirect barriers. And, and we need to all educate ourselves a little bit more in terms of recognizing what these barriers are and try and, and provide young people with the space that they need uh, to be able to advocate for, uh, for stronger the, uh, democracies. But it's also true, as, as Pete mentioned, that, you know, without a, a broader respect for human rights and democracy, it's going to be that much more difficult for youth rights to, uh, to be respected and to be, and to be upheld. So I think it's really a call towards, I think, policymakers at national level. You know, the EU obviously has a role in terms of uh, all the member states to account, and uh, that should be done more, if anything. Uh, but really, it's a, it's a call towards policymakers at national level to really do much better for, for democracy and human rights, and then as a consequence for young people, because I think, you know, Certainly over the past uh, few years, we've seen uh, a certain direction towards more uh, populist sort of uh, narratives that have really have damaged uh, the, the way we approach the human rights discourse in, uh, in Europe. And that's going to ultimately also damage current and future generations of, of young people. So, uh, so very important to point at the, at the bigger picture, I would say. True. Yeah. Lana, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think Miriam also unmuted herself. Uh, so Please if you go want ahead, to... Lana. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I uh, shamelessly I uh, was looking for a raise uh, virtual hand button uh, here, and I, I still can't find one, so I had to do it like this. Uh, I think it's a great question, and also in a follow up to what Slaja mentioned about kind of uh, these new and emerging issues, uh, and. Uh, I think our latest kind of consultation process uh, from uh, from this past month uh, indicates uh, that some of these questions are that we thought of as uh, new and emerging and kind of uh, topics that need more attention are actually becoming uh, not new and emerging, but rather crisis uh, themes that need to be addressed kind of more urgently. Uh, so climate is one of those and young people's participation in climate movements. And we, we have been working on that uh, quite a bit uh, since uh, since last year so this is something that uh, that uh, we have a lot of research on when it comes to young people's participation uh, in, in the movements um, but also to to respond to the question in terms of uh, what can young people do and what can policymakers do and i think it's really important to look at it uh, from both perspectives uh, because often we think of uh, how we can empower young people and what are the competences that young people need and of course um, we have seen also uh, one of the limitations uh, to young people accessing their rights is uh, lack of information or lack of knowledge 
which is sometimes linked with the fact that citizenship education curriculum is often cut out from the system or there is less funding for it. Uh, so there is less awareness of participation through these conventional processes, uh, which is then no surprise that young people choose to take part in more unconventional ways. But uh, then if young people know how to participate and if they do understand the system and try to work through the system, then there needs to also be on the other side, uh, kind of uh, not only the awareness, but willingness and openness uh, to really work together with young people uh, to make sure that the policies do reflect the priorities of youth. And um, I mean, of course, uh, young people uh, as a concept is something really big. Uh, so there are young people that come from different uh, different backgrounds, different categories, uh, have different priorities. Uh, so it's also important to look at it uh, kind of from a holistic perspective uh, and uh, to to think of young people who might not have uh, the possibility to voice uh, their opinions there. And uh, just uh, one more thing to reflect on the COVID crisis uh, and the hub uh, and the research that was gathered there. We have seen that uh, it is very rare uh, that young people were actually involved in uh, any decisions uh, regarding the response to the pandemic. And uh, there was a big intergenerational gap in terms of the rhetoric uh, regarding the, the pandemic and the lockdown and behaviors, etc. So. I think it's really on this one example, we have seen that uh, when we don't uh, work together across generations, uh, we can't really have the solutions uh, that that are inclusive uh, of all age groups uh, and also that are kind of, uh, well, it's difficult to have it tailor made for each, uh, but at least uh, kind of uh, the, the, the solutions that uh, respond to the needs uh, of all groups. So thank you. I pass on to Miriam now. <laughs> Thank you, Lana. No, I just want to echo what you were saying um, about the capacities within young people to contribute meaningfully to the um, evidence-based policy-making process, but then also the administration itself. Um, all too often, at least in the interviews that the OECD have conducted with member countries, consultation engagement with young people is an add-on with uh, no additional resources in the administration to really engage meaningfully with, uh, with young people with no skills within the administration uh, to, uh, to contribute to this exercise. And I think it's, it's really important also to, to pay attention on, on, the, on the administration side that they are able to uh, um, exercise uh, this, um, this process. Um, and then on, on, on what you were saying on the COVID um, hub, uh, the OECD is in the process of looking now at the recovery plans um, of, of our member countries and uh, how they have included, if they have included young people in the um, um, in the preparation of these plans. And this this paper will be soon um, be published, and I will be happy to share this with you. Uh, there are some member countries who are really placing a lot of emphasis on this, uh, most notably Canada. I'm very happy then to share this. Uh, it will be hopefully it will come out in October or even a bit earlier. That's really great to hear. Thank you both. Uh, I would say that um, including and involving young people actually in the recovery plans could be one of the first steps, right, in exercising uh, youth access to rights. But uh, the thing is really that um, we shouldn't be, I would say, playing the blame game here. We know that the governments and the public sector um, was struggling to you know, communicate things and to implement the things when it comes to, uh, you know, youth policy framework that in ways that are approachable to young people over the decades. So it's not only because, you know, the COVID-19 and crisis and so on and so forth. Every now and then we have some crisis, right? And then we need to learn from the crisis. But the good news is that now we have really this um, learning settings uh, in ahead of us, ahead of us. So I really invite you and us all to make the best use of it. And um, if there are no further questions, or maybe are there? Yeah, OK. Additional one. Yeah, my apologies. Then, There's one from a, from a participant who's joining us online. Great. So it's addressed to Flavia. Um, no internationally binding framework on youth rights still exists differently from children's rights. 
but should what should future efforts towards international frameworks and legal instruments on youth rights focus now? Uh, how can young people be engaged in such a process? That's uh, again an excellent question. We, as the Youth Forum, we've been trying to work towards advocating for an international framework on, on youth rights for a, for a number of years. Um, we, <laughs> yeah, I see some clapping from from the audience. You can see it on online. Um, but yes, indeed, it's a, it's a obviously a, an important end goal that we want to that we want to achieve. And what we try to do is, of course, keep pushing with our uh, relevant contracts at the institutional level, particularly when it comes to international frameworks. It's you know uh, the United Nations and, and member states that are uh, obviously of the of the UN. They need to really come together to to understand uh, youth rights as a, as an issue and give it the importance that it, that they deserve. Uh, we try on this to coordinate as much as possible with other, you know, uh, civil society organizations that have a focus on, on youth, but it's not something that we can achieve by ourselves. So I think the more we can build a stronger coalition, also an international coalition, I would say, because if it's just in a way, so to speak, privileged Europe that asks for a, for a convention, we're not going to go um, anywhere. But in the meantime, there are things that we can do. So what we've been trying to do with the with the European Youth Forum is to sort of mainstream youth rights within existing human rights processes at international level. So we know we have a number of international treaties that are legally binding towards uh, uh, governments in terms of in terms of the human rights obligations, and they cover either specific uh, groups, uh, children, women, or they cover specific rights, civil and political rights, economic and social and cultural rights. So what we try to do is to work with our member organizations that obviously act at national level. To then take part in this uh, human rights reviews that happen at international level. So when when member states of the UN get reviewed in terms of how they're doing with their human rights obligations, to really highlight how how things are going when it comes to youth rights and potentially violations of, of youth rights, uh, to try and bring the uh, the the topic higher up in the in the political agenda at international level. But it's it's very complicated, and I think it relates also to what was being mentioned before, also by by Lana in terms of the complexity of youth in a way. Which is also the beauty of it, I would say, because um, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, young people have uh, a flexible um, age cohort. Uh, there is no universally accepted definition of youth. Uh, it very much depends on the culture and on the specific societal setting of, of a country. What you understand as youth. I'm from Italy, so you can be young until you're 40, uh, but it might not be the same in other in other countries. Um, and that creates confusion sometimes in terms of, you know, what are youth rights? What do we define as youth? And obviously children are one of the groups that get mixed up with young people uh, the most and makes it difficult for us to advocate at international level for something that it's more overarching and specifically on, on youth. And then there's also the intersectional dimension that, it's, uh, that makes things a little bit more complicated because of course, age is not the only defining characteristic of youth. I mean, you, you're young, but you're also from, you have, you know, uh, belong to a specific community, uh, have a specific sexual orientation. There are so many things that can, you know, shape you as, as a young person and that can, you know, mean different barriers to accessing your rights. And so that's what makes it complicated. Um, but it's, uh, again, it's something that we will continue to, uh, to, to work towards too in terms of a higher recognition of youth rights uh, at all levels, uh, including the international level. So hopefully uh, uh, not too long from now, we will have uh, a legally binding instrument on, on youth rights because I think one thing that we've understood over the years, even just exchanging with uh, you know, our member organizations, youth organizations, young people, if it's not, you know, if it's not legally binding, any policy are, policies are very difficult to uh, to to implement. Uh, so, so that has to be the the main goal, uh, and yeah, uh, something to look forward to. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Flavia. Um, in wrapping up uh, this, uh, I would say very rich and insightful. Panel, I would really like to thank you all for taking the time, for being with us. Thank you, Lana. Thank you, Miriam and Flavia. Thanks again. Um, we will, yeah, we will share your inputs and links with our learners. And uh, yeah, if there are any further questions, we will keep in touch, definitely. But the good news is, uh, I would say that at least we have uh, two days ahead of us to um, start working on some concrete steps and on at least drafting the recommendations for future action and for this uh, soft push, I would say, towards the, the establishment. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> so we moved on.
Hello again. Uh, thank you again for all the panelists uh, from the uh, previous session. Uh, indeed, very insightful uh, thoughts and, and ideas for the discussions for these two days. I, um, I'm, and that's why I'm also very excited to introduce you the next uh, speaker, which is Mr. Uh, Mr. Michael O'Flaherty, which is director for the European Agency for Fundamental Rights, who's joining us online for the session. Uh, Mr. Michael, are you online? Thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning. Can you see me? Hear me? Yes, we can see you. We can hear you. Well, thank you very much for joining us from, uh, here in Lisbon. We have a panel who is very interested to hear what you have to say about the uh, right-based approach, about youth rights, and the general role of young people and uh, in enforcing um, uh, our uh, society. So thank you very much for joining us. I'll leave you to it. Thank you. My thanks to you. It's a really great pleasure. I've been I've been in the meeting since the beginning this morning and I've I've listened and learned a lot. Uh, I'm very sorry that I couldn't be with you physically. That was my plan, but it didn't uh, come about. Uh, dear friends, last Saturday in Vienna, where I'm based, uh, I watched the annual Pride March. Uh, this annual fantastic uh, display and demonstration of diversity and respect, honoring of diversity in our societies. Uh, I was struck, as always, by the fact that most of the people in the march and its impetus was from and of young people. The day before, I looked out the window of my office uh, to see a large demonstration forming on the street outside in protest uh, with regard to climate change. Again, that big, well-organized demonstration was made up mainly of and was organized by young people. The um, last summer uh, in Vienna, again, I was struck how time and time again, the Black Lives Matter protests were made up of young people uh, and organized by young people. And all of these experiences echo something that we repeatedly find in the surveys we do at the Fundamental Rights Agency. As we survey group after group after group in our society, we find levels of tolerance and inclusion increase uh, as the respondents uh, become younger. Again, young people as somehow the, the guardians of, um, of, 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 of the respect for diversity and tolerance and values in our societies. In other words, young people uh, are the drivers of change, uh, not just for themselves, but for all of us. Uh, and this is a reality we should acknowledge, treasure, and build on. Um, so much has been said this morning about the moment we're in. This is a distinct moment. This is not another crisis. This is the defining crisis of our generation. We haven't even begun yet to feel the impact globally in terms of, of, of violation of rights, loss of the right to life, uh, and devastating economic consequences of COVID. Um, by the way, uh, it's not our discussion now, but I would argue that the primary um, impacted people in the context of COVID are young people. They're maybe the group that got least attention paid to them in the past year, but as we go forward, will be the most hard hit. Um, so as we confront this huge crisis and all the other related challenges, recognizing that young people are the drivers of change, I, I'm so very glad that the discussion this morning is how young people can adopt a rights-based approach and not just adopt it, but demand it uh, from decision makers. Uh, demand it not just for young people, uh, but for everyone. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail of why we should adopt the rights-based approach. I don't have the time. Let me just recall where human rights came from. Uh, human rights came from the devastation of World War II, a sense of never again, a sense that we must do something transformative for society uh, so that we never again visit the horrors of, for example, and above all, perhaps the Holocaust. Um, it's out of this searing context uh, that a human rights system was painstakingly put in place uh, over the decades, uh, a, 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 a system that offers us a powerful, inspiring vision of what our societies can look like, or as the UN Secretary General put it last year, a common vision of what makes us human, and beyond the vision, also a roadmap, a pathway uh, through those treaties and commitments that Flavia spoke of just a few moments ago. 
So human rights and therefore the human rights approach offers us a comprehensive ethical roadmap at, through which to guide our societies. Why is it so compelling? Well, you've heard much already this morning of participation, of how the human rights approach requires as a matter of duty uh, uh, that young people participate in the, um, the decisions and the, uh, the actions that impact their lives. And indeed participation is a, is a crucial element of any rights-based approach. But let me mention a few others. Uh, one primordial one, one which underlies everything else, is that a rights-based approach is a normative approach. It's a law-based approach. It's not about favors. It's not about generosity. It's certainly not about charity. It's about entitlement. Uh, and, and this, as we've heard already this morning, is, is a non-negotiable uh, and fundamental uh, uh, important element. Uh, the flip side of normativity is accountability. Uh, under these treaties, under these legal obligations, we can hold accountable those who carry the duties. Another dimension that I would like to flag uh, that's central to the rights-based approach is its indivisibility, meaning that all human rights are of co-equal significance and they rely on each other for their fulfillment. And this most importantly means that socioeconomic rights are no less important than civil and political rights. I was struck this morning as I listened to our friend from the OECD uh, and how um, young people, according to a survey that they did, uh, recognize that governments do a good effort on youth rights, but are not so good on housing. But I immediately found myself thinking, but housing is a human right. Um, and so we need to adopt the indivisible approach. A rights-based approach is, is, is about housing, it's about social welfare, it's about jobs, as well as freedom of movement, assembly, and association. And then the final reason that the rights approach is so compelling, just the final of my examples, uh, and one which I find particularly attractive right now, is that it's about society. Adopting a rights-based approach, insisting on a rights-based approach, is about insisting not on me, but on us. And this is sometimes misunderstood about human rights. Human rights is, 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 is a framework, a tool, uh, 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 which, which, which joins us together in a mutual cooperation uh, and, and, and co-reliance. Uh, and, and the me approach is actually quite the opposite of what the modern human rights system seeks to achieve, which is about societies, communities, about us. But now let me stop here for a moment uh, and, 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 and answer the question that may be in somebody's mind, which is, but why a human rights approach? Human rights has let us down so badly. We may have constructed this amazing system since World War II, but look at the horrors since then. Look at the atrocities. Uh, look at the, the genocides since the Second World War. Look at the profound inequalities in our societies. Look at the situation of the six million Roma in the EU. And how can you talk of human rights? Well, let me, let me try to engage with that just for a moment. First thing I would say, and I do say when people throw this at me, is that we have exaggerated expectations for human rights. Human rights is a set of rules and laws foundational to changing our societies, but the actual change in our societies requires many hands. Or as the UN Secretary General put it in the same speech I quoted from just now, he said, the levers of change lie in many hands. And so we cannot blame human rights for the failure of the many hands uh, to engage the levers of change. But that said, I'm not going to give human rights uh, a clear pass. Uh, it has many weaknesses. It has inadequacies. But there may or may not be a need for another treaty on youth rights, uh, the point Flavia was making just now. But there are gaps in the protections in human rights for sure. And the, the system for the oversight of human rights is quite weak. So I acknowledge all of these things. And I use this opportunity again, if any of them are listening, to remind those who hold the levers of change that we need a stronger system of human rights. But until we get that stronger system, or even while we're waiting for it, for it we can do a better job of using human rights uh, to bring about better societies. The agency uh, where I work, the Fundamental Rights Agency, has, adopt, has identified a number of learnings 
where we who work in human rights can do a much better job. I'll briefly mention a few of these. Time isn't on my side. In the first case, we've got to make a better business case for our human rights claims. We, as was emphasized earlier today, for example, need the data. That's why my agency invests so heavily in empirical data to demonstrate to decision makers and policy makers uh, that what we're claiming is based on a verifiable empirical social realities. Secondly, when we make our claims, we've got to be much better at communicating them. Uh, we're not great at it within the human rights movement. We too often uh, stand on a high mountain of principle and say, do it because it's human rights. Uh, we've got to be more engaging, segmenting our messages to different audiences, um, also having more positive messages, not just those of, of, of despair. Third, we have to invest in partnerships. Uh, we, we, we have neglected the extent to which we can build partnerships right across society to achieve human rights goals. Let me take just two examples. Everybody's watching football right now, but are we really working enough with the world of sports, the world of soccer, uh, to promote human rights messages? We see principled actions going on on the football field. Are we engaging them in a joined up way? Are we sufficiently engaging with, with the world of culture for partnership uh, to change our societies? Fourth uh, of my brief suggestions of how we could do a better job, uh, which we're being reminded of every single day is to go local. Change happens in the village and on the street. We invest too much of our time in the ministry in the capital. And so you'll figure out what this means in your work, in your lives. But we all recognize that the town and the village needs far more attention for human rights activism. And fifth of my six points, uh, I just want to emphasize again what we heard repeatedly this morning, be gendered. Gender must be hardwired into everything we do. The experience of men and women, boys and girls is different uh, and, and, and it's usually worse for women. And so the gen gender is not a dimension for some of our work. It has to be central to everything we do. And finally, in terms of, of what we could do better now, we could do a better job of demanding a strong national architecture for the protection of human rights. Uh, I was struck again listening to our colleague from the, the OECD this morning of the um, extent to which uh, our national human rights bodies and ombudsmen uh, in some countries are not mandated to deal with youth issues. 14%, uh, I think, was the figure from the OECD. That's unacceptable. Uh, that's a demonstration of a weakness in the architecture for the protection of human rights. Uh, similarly, civil society. Uh, Creating the space for a thriving, protected, cherished civil society is an essential element of the national architecture. And, I, and, and I've, I've learned much from today's discussion and other discussions about the extent to which the space for youth organizations is, 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 is not what it should be. And when they're in place, the, 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 the spaces for them to engage, to participate in public affairs is, is not what it could be. And by the way, just one passing reference here. I was struck by what Flavi, I think it was, said about how young people are by and large not involved in um, decision making in the COVID context. Well, frankly, I'd say to you, the entire human rights community has been largely excluded from decision making uh, in most places. So let me wrap up with just one final observation. Uh, my friends, whatever I might be, I don't qualify in the category of youth anymore. Uh, I've spent something like 30 years now uh, working in the field of human rights at the international level. I've worked in Bosnia during its war, in Sierra Leone during the war there. Uh, I went on from there to countries like East Timor and Afghanistan. More recently, I've worked in Northern Ireland and now across the European Union. And I, I tell you about that, that my past because I can attest that in every place that I have worked in the past 30 years, uh, advocating for human rights, adopting a rights-based approach has been transformative for the better. It has made many lives much richer uh, in the short and in the long term. That experience of mine uh, simply echoes uh, a global reality, which is 
that the, 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 the pathway since World War II of building up a human rights system for all its weakness, for all its, its failures, it has made the world an appreciably better and fairer place. And so let me wrap up then where I began, young people as agents of change. Uh, I'd ask that you and we all work together uh, uh, to deliver the world that's pictured in Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a world where all people are born free and equal, in dignity and in rights. Thank you for your attention. Now, and thank you very much, Ms. Authority, for uh, your, I think, great speech. I think everybody here agrees with my, my opinion that you gave a lot of food for thought. And uh, especially, I think that it was important. I think the key message that you, I took from what you mentioned was rights, the ownership of rights, indeed, the importance that these rights are not given, but they are ours as and it's something that we should fight for and should something that we should in any context, young, old, uh, always um, request states to recognize them and enforce them. I think that's uh, one of the key messages that came from this. And indeed, uh, but I don't want to, the important, this moment is more about the interaction between you and uh, the participants of this session. So thank you again for the, for the wonderful speech and I opening the, the floor for any questions you might have from Mr. O'Flaherty, please. Go ahead. I don't know, Sajana, from your side, if there's any questions. No, so far, please, um, people from here in Lisbon, go ahead. I have two questions here, so I'll start with the gentleman in the middle. Hello, my name is Janis, and um, thank you for your speech in the first place. Um, I was wondering, you told us about your experiences also um, in different countries all over the world. So when we are talking about youth rights, we were mostly focusing today and of course, like in this um, event um, within Europe, but how should we try to um, implement all those rights all over the world? So what can we do to um, yeah, like have a global um, view of this topic? Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, maybe another one, and then we'll pass on to Mr. O'Flaherty. Yes, go ahead. Uh, one, two, okay. Sorry, um, I'm Peter. I won't present myself again, but I want to say that thank you so much for mentioning the pride in, uh, in Vienna of the Saturday. I, uh, I'm happy to see again this types of protests coming out in the street, uh, no matter the pandemic. And line a little bit with the previous question, we do see that the, the European Union has shared the LGBT strategy. Uh, nevertheless, we see just not even like a few months after countries like Hungary with Orban's government sharing policies that do affect young people and children in the matter of their own identities and the matter of the freedom to express themselves in the way they want to, but also learn about their own identities. And uh, as a gay person myself, I, I fight to come in terms of who I am, and I find it difficult in a space that is governed by a democratic country to question or to, in a way, uh, exclude my own existence on the terms of ideologies and uh, whatever they want to claim. How do you think that is our responsibility as, uh, as stakeholders, as policymakers, as human beings above all, <coughs> in fighting these policies and fighting these terms when we talk about rights and especially youth rights. And not only the EU, but beyond the EU, because we have the, the, the weapon, the, the power to sign agreements, to sign uh, partnerships. And we do have the responsibility by doing so to make sure that the countries we work with are also working on human rights. And, and I know that your agency is working a lot on this. And I, I want to thank you at least personally on the work you do uh, on this matters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for both your questions. Ms. O'Farity, if you might. Sure, thank you. Thank you to both of you. These are vast questions and um, I, I can't begin to do them justice. And in a way, they're the same question. Um, at the, the, so let me, let me do my best uh, in just a few moments. Uh, 
Let me start with the issue of denying identity. Uh, I, I can think of few things more deplorable uh, than, than denying your right to be who you are. Uh, and the, um, it, to the extent that that's happening in the EU, it's a cause of most enormous distress. Uh, and we have to use the tools that we have uh, to push back against such clear abuses of rights. Uh, the, um, the, the EU strategy is, 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 is important, it really is, uh, and it's full of hard and soft approaches. Uh, and by the way, always we need the hard and the soft approaches to transform our societies, to tackle the prejudice and intolerance. Um, it's not just about law, it's, a, it's, a, it's about intolerance uh, on our streets. Uh, my own country, Ireland, is fated uh, as having uh, somehow surpassed all the limits uh, and have delivered fairness in terms of uh, 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 recognition and respect. Uh, but at the same time, less than half of same-sex couples uh, in Ireland are willing to walk down the street holding hands. So that says about how much we have to invest also in society. Um, how do we work globally? Um, well, first we have to. <laughs> Um, uh, and I really welcome the, this focus today, because if we just stay on our own corner of the world, we're, 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 we're missing the reality. Uh, when I was speaking about the disaster of COVID right now, I was actually mostly thinking not of Europe. Uh, I was thinking of countries where we, we haven't even had the major uh, 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 rate of deaths, the assaults on the hospitals. It's all coming in so many places. Uh, there's the issue of vaccine distribution, of vaccine justice. That, that, that issue is only beginning. Uh, and, and, and we must adopt global approaches to locate and, and contextualize our own concerns. And then once we've done that, work globally. You're much better placed than me. Uh, you know how youth movements uh, cooperate uh, uh, across regions. Uh, but all I would say is that cross-regional solidarity and cross-regional twinning and partnership uh, uh, is, is, is absolutely critical. And we in the Fundamental Rights Agency, when we have major events, we try, by the way, to demonstrate these partnerships by bringing non-European voices into our room uh, to give us some context to contextualization as we talk about our problems. Um, the last thing I would say is, 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 is um, never lose hope for the United Nations. Uh, 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 never stop investing in the UN as the great multilateral space uh, where we can engage across the world to make things that bit better. Uh, again, back to the LGBT issue, there's now a, a UN expert uh, on issues of sexual orientation who's doing really important work, groundbreaking, uh, pioneering work to open up the discussion and the reflection on a global level in a way which ultimately uh, could lead to strengthening and improvement. So invest in the United Nations, you know, use the, the, the youth movements across the world. You, as I said, you know much more than me uh, as a space for solidarity uh, and never cease to be outraged, never cease to be angry, never cease to be outraged, never allow the unacceptable be tolerated. Uh, and that brings me right back to the comments of the second speaker there regarding uh, some of the tendencies in Europe right now, which I absolutely repudiate. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. O'Farity, for your uh, comments. I have another question from the public. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Marius. I'm vice president of the German National Youth Council. We represent 6 million young people in 53 youth organizations. Uh, thank you very much for highlighting a bit um, the historic background of human rights, um, because it's not only a never again, but it's also a resist the beginnings. And uh, as you said, human rights are one of the major tools we've got to never let it happen again. Uh, yet in the European Union, we see um, in the case of the Mediterranean Sea, um, how we are not only failing to protect human rights, but how we are actively uh, fighting human rights, attacking human rights. Um, those of refugees uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, we know that, uh, for example, in Libya, the, um, the camps that people are, are living at, uh, the German Federal Foreign Ministry called them concentration camp-like facilities. Those are facilities paid for with European money. Uh, we know that um, the Greek and the Italian Coast Guard um, have had a lot of cases of illegal pushbacks supported um, and executed by Frontex, a European agency with support of national police um, authorities, including our own. Uh, we know that German police officers have been part of those operations. Um, so my question to you is, uh, how, how much can the a fundamental rights agency play a part in 
the European Union uh, leaving this shameless uh, or shameful chapter behind and, and becoming a, a, a authentic and a, a credible actor in human rights again. Thank you very much for that uh, question. Uh, I don't know, Sajana, if in the meantime there was any questions from the public online. Uh, no worries. Uh, I incentivize if at any point you want to ask a question to Mr. Authority, just raise your hands or type in the chat. In the meantime, please, Mr. Authority, uh, it's a complex question, but I'll, I'm sure you have an, ans uh, an answer for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you to Marius. Um, the, the Fundamental Rights Agency uh, has two pretty relevant uh, mandate limitations here. Uh, forgive me for starting with the negative, but uh, just so that you're aware. The first is geographical. We are exclusively concentrated on the activity, what's going on within the context of the EU geographically. Uh, and so the situation in North Africa is quite simply outside our mandate. Uh, and the other, the other limitation is that we're solely advisory. Uh, we have no executive power. We don't make decisions. We don't adopt laws. We can't strike down a law. We can't pass judgment. We're only as good as the advice we give. But within those limits, we're doing what we can in the context of migration. We're on the ground uh, in Greece. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're at the external borders. We're working with all the actors on the external borders to, to make the reception conditions more humane. Uh, the, um, there's still a long way to go, but a lot has been achieved. Uh, child protection uh, is done better uh, now in these facilities at some of the external borders than would have been the case before the agency uh, uh, became engaged. We're also working with other EU agencies like Frontex to build up its own human rights capacity. They're, uh, they're recruiting now a, a, a 25 uh, fundamental rights officers in that agency and we're actively supporting that exercise, which is for obviously for the good um, we're also uh, uh, stepping back from work on the ground. We're continuing to do all the related research. We'll publish uh, in the next couple of weeks our annual update uh, on the interception of ships in the Mediterranean. This is something we've done each year uh, to, to, to keep a focus of attention on the interception of ships and what it means in terms of, of, of lives. Uh, we, we also continue with our um, our every three to four months public reporting uh, on the treatment of migrants across, I think it's 14 now, 14 EU member states, uh, month by month by month, the story. Uh, not because the story will change practice, but this, it provides the evidence base uh, that can be used by you and by others uh, to, to work with national governments uh, to make the situation a more humane one. So within the limits of our mandate, we're doing what we can in, in this, in this area of, of high priority for any Europe that values values. Thank you very much, Ms. Wafariti. We have time just for one last question. So please go ahead. I don't know, Sajana, if you, there's any, not virtual. So. No, in that case, I don't know, Mr. Ferretti, if you have any last, uh, last closing words. Thank you very much again for taking part in this session. You gave us a lot to think about and uh, a lot of different contexts. We talked about Frontex, we talked about LGBTI rights in Europe. We talked about how the importance of like working with in different countries and understanding different country contexts. But please, and uh, if you have uh, some closing uh, words, go ahead. And thank you again for taking part. No, my, my thanks to you. I think I've already said an awful lot. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to wish you well with this really important work and, 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 and just never lose sight that when we talk about uh, youth rights and using a rights-based approach in young people and working to better the experience, never forget that you're also working for us. Um, our society, our aging European society needs the it needs a, a, a passionately driven leadership from young people if we're to navigate our way out of the mess that we're in. So thank you for your for the time and attention. The best of luck for the remainder of the conference. No, thank you very much. Um, we'll take your advice on board. Um, please stay online. There's more conversations to take part. There's a breakout session, so we'll be more than happy to have you on board as well. Uh, Talking about the breakout sessions, we're 
nearing the um, our coffee break, which will start a bit later. Our apologies for this, but there's three breakout sessions. Uh, one on participation and inclusion, which is happening on room one, uh, transparency and accountability on room two, and uh, equality and non-discrimination room three. The, the rooms are also the same for the people who are here present. For the participants who are joining us online, please log in through, the, through your credentials on the, on the official uh, event webpage. And there's a uh, going to working sessions and please click on the session that you want to join then our technical staff will, uh, will put you in the right room at 11.30 when we start. Um, I just have one thing left to say, which is thank you very much for the time. Enjoy your coffee break. Uh, see, you he uh, see you not here. See you at the breakout sessions already. Please be there 10 minutes before. The session will be virtual for even for the participants thinking, uh, who are here physically in Lisbon. You'll be provided computers. If you have your own computer, there's a Zoom session that will be set up for you. But be there 10 minutes before so we can make sure that all the technical are correct and there's no issues. Many thanks. Enjoy your coffees. A rights-based approach to youth policies is one of the main priorities of the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the European Union in the field of youth, in line with the EU Youth Strategy 2019-2027. In this framework, the Portuguese Institute of Sport and Youth and the European Commission, in cooperation with the European Youth Forum and the Portuguese National Youth Council, co-organized the Peer Learning Activity, PLA, a rights-based approach to youth policies in a hybrid format on the 22nd and 23rd of June, 2021 at IPDJ, Lisbon News Center, Portugal. The peer learning activity aims to bring together member states, young people, researchers, and key players in the field of youth for an exchange of views on rethinking youth and youth policies aligned with a rights-based approach.